Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Ryan, I'm Charles. We're here to talk about a gravel company called Martin Marietta. We wanted to find something more boring than Kimball. I think we did it. <laughs> yeah, they, they do concrete, gravel, cement, um, asphalt, pretty much pretty much anything related to uh, dirt products basically. So so I think I think we're there. It's about as basic as it comes. Um, we're just basically gonna go through the, the handout that we gave you guys item by item. We think they're um, they're interesting for investment, a potential investment because with pri primarily they have a, a very sustainable competitive advantage we think over other aggregates companies. When shipping gravel, it's it's extremely low value, and you you can only ship it about 70 miles before you're uh, before you start paying more for the shipping cost, and the gravel is actually worth if you're shipping it by truck. And so where your quarry is located in relation to construction projects is extremely important. Martin Marietta has high exposure to a lot of like the, um, I forget how many of the cities, but some of the largest growing cities in the United States, they're, they're right right next to. And so it, they, they're the primary supplier to those construction markets. And it, in addition, it's very difficult for new companies to be able to get permitting to build a new quarry in these highly populated areas. There's not a lot of space. It's more useful for housing, things like that. And so existing, the fastest growing cities. Yeah, existing quarries are, are kind of it for, for supplying gravel and then turning it into concrete and things things like that. Um, and like one one quarry, I think Martin Marietta currently, and on, on average out of the quarries, has a supply for another 50 years worth of, of gravel at current consumption rate. So there's not there's not a need for them to construct new quarries either. Also, their stock price, I'm gonna go to the stock price slide, has been taking, maybe do the, the one year one. Next one. Can you put the one there you go. Yeah, they've been this orange line is Martin Marietta. They've been taking a battering in the current the current year. They've uh, I think they've dropped like twenty five percent, and we were unable to find a, a real reason for that other other than market general market outlook and like concept um, perception of what what's entailed for the construction market. But their their revenues growing, their their net income's growing, operating margins are improving, their debt's still low. Like there's no real fundamental reason for this massive decline that we were able to detect. Estimates are still strong for their earnings um, and whatnot. So we're not we're not exactly sure why why that is, other than they, they pretty much match the there's there's a um, an index fund that goes specifically for construction materials within the basic material sector. They pretty much match that completely in terms of their movements, and so I think that's that's a large part of it. If you would look at the financial and valuation metrics on the first page, they have the the EPS jumped up almost double in 2017 when it was in 2016. That's not actually real. A lot. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, just then you said their operating margins improving. Y yeah, not not in the trailer. But, to, um, yeah, but right. throughout the 2016 to 2017, it de I mean a little bit it went, it went down and then here, the trailing right? 12 months, it's also been decreasing. I, I I didn't mean to say operating margin there. Okay. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> yeah, their their revenue has been improving. Their net earnings have been improving. Cash flow has been improving. Operating margin has not. Although it's it's holding relatively stable within the range. It's not fluctuating largely. I guess. Um, as far as like. Earnings per share and price to earnings goes. It was capital asset intensive companies like materials companies are, are very affected by changes in tax law because they have to look to revalue. With this this latest act that happened in 2017, they had to revalue all their deferred tax liabilities. And since it's a it's a law that's preferential to them than the current or than the uh, preceding one was, they had a huge gain as a result of that that directly hits net income. And so it, it skews all those metrics and makes them look better than they really are. If you if you back out the effects of that tax law change, their real earnings per share for 2017 would have been more like 720 or so rather than the 11 1130 that's there. But because we're comparing them to other companies that operate in the material sector, they, they're all affected by the tax law change. And so you can kind of, um, if, if you use caution, you can you can compare them to one another within within that sector. I guess so. Just be be aware that some of the price price earnings ratios and, and things like things like that that pertain to earnings are very very off from other industries. I suppose we arrived at a target price of uh, two hundred and sixty six dollars a share, primarily from the free cash flow to the firm model. They had a big bond issue in twenty seventeen because they were trying to buy a uh, another competitor in, in the Tennessee Valley area, I believe. Um, 
And so at the end of 2017, they had all of this debt sitting in, sitting in cash because they hadn't actually completed the acquisition yet. It didn't go through until this year. And so free cash flow to equity pumped out a, a, a really crazy share price because it like doubled their debt load, essentially. So we selected free cash flow of the firm based on that. We also did uh, a price to earnings valuation comparing them to other comparable companies that we selected. All, all materials companies are down a lot. So that one we felt like wasn't necessarily representative of what their long-term worth is because they're all, they're all down at the moment, but it was interesting to compare them to one another and see where they were at in that regard. We also did a DDM because we needed, we needed a third one and it didn't really seem like free cash flow to equity was gonna be useful in that sense. So we uh, chose to focus on those. Do you wanna, do you wanna go over, I, I think I skipped the page. <laughs> okay. Um, so like Ryan was saying, uh, they provide crushed stone, sand, gravel, they do roads um, and railroad road beds. So uh, train track. Um, they also out in Colorado have an, uh, an asphalt and paving company here. That's what that little dot is out in Colorado. Um, as we can see here, most of their operations are in Texas and over in the East Coast. Um, they've been buying a lot of companies recently, um, and most of those have been in the South and Texas. Um, we're going to talk about those a little bit later. They provide CNET, um, based out of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and some in Colorado. Um, they actually just bought the largest cement concrete company in Texas recently. Um, and they also operate a magnesia specialties company in Michigan and Ohio and that provides magnesium and they, they have customers worldwide. And that's for agricultural and mining. And I don't actually know what it does. It, it got very technical very quickly, but it provides magnesium products. So they have a couple factories and that's what those are. Uh, for their management and governance, um, they've had really long-term. Uh, so their main product lines, some asphalt cement. Or wait, yes. Can you go go through those one more time quickly. Sorry. Um, the main product lines: uh, crushed stone, sand, gravel, asphalt, cement, concrete, and then also paving. Uh, and but that's only in Colorado. So most of those materials are the kind of like low value added, won't travel very far from their right. home. Yes. And then they have this magnesium business. It, it's only about 10% of revenue. Okay. Right. It's very, very small compared to yeah. the rest of their operations. Down. And there they have global customers. Yes. Okay, sorry, um, thank you. So the specific breakdown of that here, we can see it. Most of the, the magnesium is 7% specifically. Most of it, the aggregates are the sand, rock, gravel. And that's that's the stuff that travels no more than 70 miles. So, okay. Um, yeah, their uh, chairman, president, and CEO, all the same person. He's been there since 2010. Um, he's managed to avoid. They don't really get a whole lot of um, goodwill when they acquire any companies. They managed to avoid paying too much for anything that they've acquired. Um, they haven't really made a whole lot of strategic blunders. They they really haven't made any missteps since he's been in charge. Um, and you know, actually have to go multiple places. He, he didn't start out as chairman, president, and CEO. Um, but they also don't tell you really got all three of those titles. So he's acquired them through being there for the last eight years. Um, uh, they had a long-term CFO. Uh, she retired last August, and they pulled the former CFO from Caterpillar. So Caterpillar might talk about them today. They might be going a bit south, um, and they don't have their CFO, but they have them for long term. Um, they've added things. All the companies that they've added just are in their add-ons to what they did. They're not adding like something that isn't in line with their business. They're not doing things like Tencent did, where they're like, oh, we're video games, and now we do music, and now we do streaming, and now we do cloud computing, or we do rock, and now we do paving, and now we do asphalt, and now we do road building. They're all things that relate to the business. So, for the 
corporate operations and strategy. So this is where they operate. Um, these are the larger cities in the country. Um, these are the fastest growing cities in the country. This is census data. So if you can only truck something 70 miles before it becomes cost ineffective, and these are your locations, those places are the biggest, those places are growing, you've already got your operations set up. Like you're going to be the person that makes money. You've already got your quarries in place. You can't really, you can't start digging a new quarry from scratch. You already own the land, you own the business, you own the quarries, you've got the license, and you've got the permits. You're the person, you're Johnny on the spot. I mean, um, and especially the Texas area and the, uh, what they call the Denver area and the I-25 corridor, that's the Denver, Colorado Springs area. Um, that's a huge projected growth area as is uh, Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta. Um, that's actually not Atlanta, that's actually Franklin, Tennessee. I think, I think it was on the other, the other slide, yeah. Was it? Yeah, it is. But uh, yeah, no. So they're positioned around the largest metro areas, the fastest growing metro areas, and they've already got their permits in place. They've already got their resources positioned. They've already got the contracts with the local, you know, state and local governments. That they are the go-to people for making your roads, for making your railroads, for setting everything up. But key thing to note: they don't accept in. Colorado, they don't build the roads. The only place that they do that is in Denver. So, if we were to go repave a road and we contracted to them, for example, they wouldn't do it, they just supply the things. So they don't have that exposure. Yeah, um, well, on, on that note, they're, they're still extremely exposed to the construction market. Like, that's that's what they do. They're just not actually engaged in the in the, the actual constructing. They're merely supplying materials for it. Um, also, I wanted to, to mention that, that both they, like like Charles hit on, they're, all their revenue growth, basically, they, um, comes from buying companies that fit into their core business strategy. They don't they don't diversify at all. They're really just doing one thing that they're that they're good at, and they're adding companies onto that by and and man by managing their debt load and keeping that low and making very very precise acquisitions of other companies. That's how they grow their customer base and expand into new areas. The price of gravel actually went up last year, so they did they did get some revenue growth from <laughs> from that ironically, but most of their growth comes from acquisitions. We used, for doing the relative valuation, we selected several comparable companies. Vulcan Materials, which is first first year on the list, is really the only one that, that's a, 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 an excellent comparable company to them. I would say they operate in similar markets. They have a lot more exposure, though, to California and some of the western states than Martin Marietta does. But they're similar in size, doing similar similar things. Summit is considerably smaller. Heidelberg is a, or Heidel, Heidelberg is a large German conglomerate, but they, they have extensive cement and aggregates operations in the U.S., so they weren't a great one to include there, but we, we felt that they were, it, would, it would help balance out Eagle, which also wasn't, wasn't great. They have a lot more exposure to energy construction projects than any of the other aggregates companies do, um, but we wanted something to get a basis off for doing the relative valuations. Probably the highlights here on um, on comparing them to these, these companies is the interest coverage ratio, EBIT to interest. Martin Marietta, because their debt load is, is much lower than Vulcan's, has a lot better coverage of that of their fixed charges related to that debt. They're they're much quite more financially sound, I think, than Vulcan is, and uh, could potentially carry on their their acquisition strategy into the future because they're not rather than struggling with balancing their huge debt load and using their earnings to meet meet those charges they can they can they've already got that covered and can focus on making new acquisitions I guess and, and continuing to grow their revenue into the years to excuse me into the years to come. They also have um, they're slightly lower priced if you look at PE than Vulcan is. They have a better operating margin than Vulcan does, although as Peter pointed out it has it has fell. I remembered why I included that it, that it had been rising. It had been rising over like a five five to ten year period, but not not since twenty sixteen. So it dropped, it dropped from 2016, but if you look over, over a period, it had been going up. 
Um, they've also been growing their EPS, but like like I mentioned, that's pretty skewed by tax. But there is real growth buried in there if you back out the tax effects. They also, if Trump, um, hang on, excuse me. That's about all I wanted to cover on the comparable companies, which uh, ties into their capital structure and balance sheet highlights. I mainly like that they had very, very low debt and just were, they seemed really financially sound. Even if their earnings did drop a bit, they're not going to experience like with the event or something like that. They have, they have good, strong cash. They don't have a whole lot of, uh, of debt that they have to juggle. They're just a company doing really something really basic, really fundamental that all construction projects need. Uh, yeah, there's nothing nothing really special about them, I guess, but they're not. <laughs> um, oh, cap capex over time, they haven't been like put, putting off maintenance on anything. This is just relative to sales because they've been growing so much in size over time. It was hard hard to look at it just as a number, so we thought relative to their revenue was more representative. They've been making significant investments in their machinery more recently. And so you're not going to have a, a lot of um, fully depreciated equipment getting needing to be replaced into the future that would affect their affect their earning capability. I guess they've, they've been they've been investing soundly in their assets. So speaking of their assets, like yeah. what's the average life of a quarry? Like, are any of their their existing kind of quarries? Do they provide data about? How long they can mine there? They they estimate they have another fifty years of supplies on average in their quarries. Okay. At, at current at current use levels. Okay. Yeah. How much land do they own in those areas? Because if you have a quarry, usually you can build one a mile away. Like. They they, they have it. significant. I'm not I'm not sure what it is on average. They do have a lot of land though, because once they once they get the rock from the quarry, then it has to be stored in giant <coughs> piles and then mixed into cement. They have they have pretty extensive op operations. I don't know what the average. So there's not severe competition for them in those areas? Not, not in the areas that they're in because they typically when they expand into a, near, a new area, they'll buy up the pre-existing quarry that, there that's already the largest. And so they that smaller quarry will have bought out all their other competitors there. So by the time Martin Marietta buys them up, there's basically nobody left. And there's not, in, in like more rural areas, there's a lot of space to build new quarries. But in, in the key metropolitan markets, there's, there's, no, there's no space. There's houses everywhere, I guess. There's there's space farther outside the city, but you're gonna have to pay more for that house, so it makes it less competitive. Um, they do they are they are extremely exposed to changes in construction market spending. They have a lot of public um, public sector exposure with regard to their road. Yeah, go ahead. Peter. No. Um, well, did you have any like um, either numbers or data for expected construction spending? Yeah, actually, Poss every, either just over the nation or maybe by. The places that they yeah te in. Texas, which is where they have a, a, like extensive operations, it actually has um, their state government has been allocating resources to, to invest in their roads in the years to come, and so about forty percent of Martin Marietta's aggregate revenue comes from road road development. So they're, they're poised to get more more revenue from that area. In, in addition, U.S. infrastructure spending as a whole is supposed to. Um, increased by about six percent per year. The general consensus is that, is that current infrastructure spending levels are not keeping up with like road health um, throughout the nation. So they're going to get some benefit from that. Housing is supposed to taper off a bit in the years to come, but not not dramatically. That they, I think they're out of all the sectors, their exposure is the smallest to residential construction. They have large large exposure to commercial construction, but residential is, is a lower percent of their market share for, for aggregates. Sounds like you're kind of heading this direction anyway. Yeah. But how how much uh, like if you look at their customer concentration, how much is public sector versus private sector? Um, it works out to about half of their revenue total coming from public sector. Okay. Because aggregates makes up if the, um, we had a revenue segmentation there. Aggregates makes up about half half of the revenue in and of itself, and a, roughly a quarter of that, and varies by year, is um, specifically related to public sector spending. But all these other sectors as well catered to about the same percentage of infra public infrastructure spending as well. So it works it works out to rough, roughly half, I believe. I wanted to dig into that a little bit more. Some of the information was hard to come by. I think that would be a good thing to look at. Because we were thinking that that would provide, because in, in general, public sector spending is more stable than private sector through sure. through business cycle changes. And so we thought that that would at least provide some, some um, 
stability to their earnings independent of the business. Yeah. So we're going to use a specific percentage on that. And just also be interesting to see, uh, because you're talking a lot about road, um, and so some of that might be like federally funded, like highway, yes. um, but some of it might also be local. Yeah. Local government. So just looking at the levels of, of government spending, because it's it would be the, the difference between having one customer, one federal customer, yeah. as, you know, as their number one customer, versus having some diversity within the, the public sector still. So. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the road, um, their road building customers at least are actually state governments. Mm -hmm. so they're handling all the not not so much for freeways and interstates, but for just roads within the state, like like D Alaska DOT. Handles all our roads. Other states are similar, and so they'll actually be the ones that put out road contracts. And like Granite or some other construction company will go and fulfill that contract, but they'll buy all the gravel from on their end. Yes, and so state governments and and the federal government, and like like Kim mentioned, local all all play a role. It's not not just federal. Yeah, I'd like to. Well, uh, I'm, are you guys? You guys probably have more. Um, a little. Uh, just okay. little, just two last okay. sections. Okay. And then, uh, um, so the investment risks um, that they have are the macroeconomic trends, just like Brian was just talking about, you know, the economic cycle goes down with half the revenue coming from the private sector, that will obviously affect them. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot they can do about that. If, if nobody's buying gravel and concrete, then their revenue will suffer. Um, but with half of it coming from public sector that helps to, to offset statewide. Most governments do like to keep the roads kept up. That, that helps keep people happy. Um, price of fuel, uh, specifically natural gas, coal, and peat coke, which uh, utility people talked about the other day. Uh, for 2018, 100% of the coal and peat coke have been secured at fixed prices, as well as 30%, 33% of the natural gas needs. Uh, have been secured, and those are to fuel their uh, power plants for the uh, mainly for the cement and the concrete, but also some for the asphalt and the magnesium uh, for the plants for that. Over those percentages again? 100% uh, of the coal and peat coke needs for 2018, and 33% of the natural gas needs. The mm -hmm. 10K did mention that that could only be done on a yearly basis, and I'm assuming that's because of variabilities year to year and fuel. So if you know, coal is higher next year than this year, you wouldn't want to secure you know, a two or three or five year contract. So they did mention specifically that it could all be done yearly. So I'm assuming that they do try and secure a yearly contract as soon as possible though. Um, and so are they just locking in prices with an actual contract? Or yes. are they so they're not using like a, like futures or financial markets to okay. they didn't go into a whole lot of detail it literally just said we have secured 100% of our needs that was as much detail as they went into about it on the 10k I'm assuming that they would get a contract with said most of their it's coming from the US I would assume that they would go to another coal mine and, and secure say hey you provide us this it's just I'm so I can look into that some more. Yeah, you just want to see if they're um, essentially like using derivative instruments or financial instruments to kind of lock in prices. Um, and you should be able to find that in the 10K. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay. And they did mention that the, the prices were 22% of cement production costs. So that's a, you know, it's a significant portion. Uh, and then also the price of oil. So oil right now is really going up. Uh, so oil is a key component of asphalt. As we know, it also oil fuels all of the construction vehicles and trucks that they use. So their entire fleet runs on diesel. Uh, oil is also a key thing for lubricants. So all of their trucks, all the excavation equipment, all the big rigs, and all of their railroads run off of oil and lubricant bases. So if oil prices go up, that's, that has primary and secondary effects. So it's more expensive to operate your vehicles. It's also more expensive to keep them running, which is something that I don't think we generally consider. Um, it's also just more expensive to make the asphalt. Sure. Um, 
If I were to look at this as a five forces analysis, I'd say your key risks here are your uh, suppliers and buyers. If you think about suppliers as basically energy producers, because you have little control over commodities costs, and then if you think about buyers, um, not that any there's one particular like a strong concentration, although it sounds like they do have some customer concentration, but more just fluctuation in the construction industry is probably a key concern as well. So they're kind of squeezed a little bit on both sides. Um, but otherwise, you guys mentioned um, a bunch of uh, factors that are actually quite attractive in terms of geographic uh, placement. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned they have no goodwill? Or no, they, goodwill? They, do, they do have goodwill, okay. but they haven't had to write it down over the years. It's, it's, they haven't been paying um, a ton for their acquisitions relative to their, the fair value of the assets. I think they've accumulated about $2 billion of goodwill, though. Okay. Um, but there, there haven't been any write down for the past couple years. Okay, but, and that cues up this slide, because I was just going to ask you about whether they're growing primarily organically or through acquisitions. Almost exclusively through acquisitions. Okay. <laughs> so this is when and what they've gotten and where it is. So in 2008, they did an asset exchange with Vulcan, one of their primary competitors, for six locations in Tennessee and Georgia, as well as bringing two aggregate plants online. Uh, in the next year, in 2009, they acquired three quarries from Cimex in the western U.S. Um, western U.S. Uh, in 2011, they did an asset, asset exchange with the Lafarge North American, that's what got them the asphalt and paving services in Denver. So if you're going to kind of summarize this, yes. where are they primarily buying assets? Are they buying companies or are they buying assets? Because it looks like... Um, so they started out they just assets. Um, towards the mm -hmm. bottom, they tend to buy companies. Um, their biggest two have been Texas Industries, Texas Industries, Texas Industries. and then they bought Bluegrass, which is in like the Tennessee and Ohio. Um, area in the, in the current like year, they finally shot that, that off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they also, in 2016, started up a subsidiary rail line company, uh, Medina Rock and Rail, um, and that just ships them around South Texas uh, by rail, obviously, to get around shipping by truck. Makes it a little bit cheaper. Okay. Um, I don't know how long 800 million tons will last. So in their Some major markets, markets, do they have a significant number of competitors, or will they? They're pretty much it in their major markets, okay. as far as we can tell. Okay. Most of it. Um, and then in the additional catalyst and news, um, there was a guy on the 16th who was arrested for setting fire to one of their quarries in Minnesota. Um, he tried to set fire to it back in 2015. He caused 2.6 million in damages. Uh, he got 15 counts of arson. He's currently in jail in St. Cloud. Do you think that news will move the stock? No, that's the first thing you get if you Google. Uh, yeah. Okay. It looks like a cream, so we figured it was worth it. Okay. Yeah. Literally, the first, like, the first five stories are about this guy. Uh, maybe, maybe not anymore. We wrote this. Yeah. So, class, what do you guys want to know about concrete and aggregates? How much of their yeah. fuel is from uh, pet coke and coal? Like what? What percentage the of their consumption of, their, of, it, of yeah. their fuel consumption? I'm not sure off the top of my head. For their plants, I believe all of it. You know, yeah. they, I don't think they used an oil fired plant. So it was all oil. Is it, is it Petco? Petroleum. So pet. pet. Okay. They're they're very sensitive to it though, as far as their yeah. their cost. So that it's mostly based yeah. On the thing. yeah, that'll that'll have like a directly negative effect on their operating margin for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Yeah, JP. Um, it's a question on your balance sheet highlights. Yeah. It might explain why it took a dip. Um, so if you just look at the 2018 Q2, mm -hmm. the uh, net PP and E is actually going up by 1.5 billion. Yes. And they, yeah, go ahead. Do you know why they did that? Because if you look at this, the current liabilities, the long term debt, they're not really changing that much. And if you look at the net income, it's also not changing that much. So did they release new stock? No, they, they, the they issued bonds in 2017 to acquire blue, uh, blue cra bluegrass materials, I think is what it was called. Um, bluegrass is basically all, all you need to know. But they, they actually completed that acquisition in Q2 of 2018. So all their, all their assets went way up. 
um, but they'd already issued the debt for it in the prior year. So, the, so the, it was towards the end of Q2, and they haven't filed their, they haven't issued their Q3 uh, report, so they haven't gotten to realize a lot of net income from that acquisition yet. Gotcha. Think. But so that that's what affects all their all their um, their assets does with the one and a half billion increases there, since they're they're fully consolidated. Okay, so bluegrass is. looks like it's a fairly sizable acquisition, especially just compared to. Yes, that looks okay. Do you want to go back to the like where they have their quarries on the slide? That was this this whole area here. Basically, it was for bluegrass. Okay. So they, they didn't have that before this year. Okay. Um, and. So that's something you might want to think about following up on is looking at Bluegrass when it was a standalone company okay. and seeing if you thought, thought it was attractive. Right. Um, yeah, I think maybe, so unless there's other questions from class, general comments. Um, I like your handout. It's a little, like it's well written. A um, couple things I would look at. Um, I look at the two. It seems like their two big concerns are kind of fuel prices, like the mm -hmm. cost of inputs, and then also um, customer concentration and just the fate of the construction industry. Yes. So I'd probably look at just are they hedging their fuel costs? Maybe a little more detail on that. Um, I'd look at this bluegrass acquisition just to see if you liked the company and you think it's going to be productive since it really isn't reflected in their earnings yet. Um, and then I'd look at uh, customer concentration, both public and private sector, and then maybe some general statistics about overall spending on roads and growth in construction. They, it said you guys said they weren't exposed necessarily to residential construction, but. If uh, commercial construction is something they have a big exposure to, maybe look at commercial construction growth. Okay, yeah, they, they are exposed to residential construction. It's just smaller relative to the other sectors. Okay. So they, they still have significant exposure. Yeah, so just some macro okay. level trends around uh, their kind of customer base in the construction industry. Um, so we can kind of see where we. I think this do dovetails nicely with that headline that I showed a little bit because it might be yes. that their price is depressed even though they're not a large exporter. Um, just generally because the industrial sector is taking a hit. Um, so it might be more of a sentiment thing. Yeah, that's kind of what we were thinking, but we're having a hard time conveying. <laughs> so to kind of justify that or to make that case, I would probably look at the entire sector or the entire industry and see okay. what's kind of happened to like the PE across the industry um, or stock prices across the industry. How are they doing? Um, and if you see generally a decline across the whole sector, um, it might be it might be more sentiment based, right? Um, and these guys are just getting lumped in there, even though they don't they aren't an exporter. Okay. Right? Yeah. Any questions from the class? Did we find a, a company that does something less interesting than that's not office furniture? True. <laughs> <laughs> this company rocks.